Are you wasting money on subscriptions you forgot you were paying for, but you don't want to go through the hassle of finding and canceling them all? Then you need Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows you all of your subscriptions in one place and then cancels for you whatever you don't still want. Go to rocketmoney.com slash holly and save money now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited to introduce my guest today. He is an author, a philosopher, a coach, and so much more who has worked for 25 years in the BDSM and kink communities. He is at the forefront of a healthy masculine movement and is truly one of the smartest, most insightful people you'll ever talk to about sex and sensuality. Let's welcome Orpheus Black. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Thank you for bringing me to your audience. Fantastic. And I very much appreciate your time. So let's start at the beginning. How did you get into this line of work? Because, you know, this is not um, the usual uh, job career that people would necessarily choose, but it seems to be very well suited for you. (laughs) Well, thank you for asking. Um, The path that I traveled to get to this place was actually a little weirder than me being it. Um, I wound up in a poly relationship with my high school sweetheart and my current wife. And, um, my high school sweetheart left us for a dom. And I was like, what is a dom? Who is dom? Dom must be short for Dominic. Who do I know named Dominic? It must've been some guy. And I was like, when I see Dom, I'm going to punch him in the face. I, I just went on this kind of tangent about this mysterious dom. Then when it didn't work out for them, she said, I have to introduce you to this world. She took me to Hollywood, which was like the mecca of kink and BDSM at the time. And we went to a goth industrial club and I had no idea what goth or industrial was. I had no idea what BDSM was or kink was. And I walked in, they pulled back the curtains and all this amazing psychosexual aspects were happening on stage. And it's there that I met my mentor and a good friend. Uh, and he said, do you want to do this? And I said, yeah. And I really never looked back. And that's how I got into this line of business. Wow. So you really just went and started to experiment in this lifestyle. And then did you like immediately see this as being your life's work or did it take you a while to arrive to that conclusion? Actually, the, the first kind of idea or indicator that I want to be in this was this idea that I wasn't weirded out by what was happening. I mean, I'm literally sitting on the side of a stage watching a man in a skirt and mohawk stand on another woman's le- neck who is suspended in a crucifix. And I'm like, I can do that. <laughs> that was the first thing that I could get pops into my mind. I'm like not weirded out by it at all. You know, most people would have run for the door. Boom. Right. And I was like, I felt like I was at home. Like it it was always existing in me dormant with no label, with no way of understanding uh, what that was because there was no uh, words to match the the feelings that wanted to be expressed. Right. Could you be a little more specific about like what those feelings were? Yeah. You know, Soren Kierkegaard said, if you label me, you negate me. But here's the other thing. Not only do we negate things by label things, but we also bring them into existence through labeling. If you never saw what an umbrella was, right? If you never knew what an umbrella was, if there was no label, then you have no conceptual awareness around how you would interact with it, how it's useful to you, what's beneficial about it to you. You never get to say, hey, you know, I didn't know I needed that. And so Mm -hmm. for me, Uh, Growing up in the inner cities, growing up in uh, Southern Baptist religion, growing up in this this space where kind of everybody's one of this homogenous mass as it pertains to sex and sexuality, I didn't get to know that there was something other than what was pre-prescribed. And so Mm -hmm. when I walked in the door, I'm like, I didn't know I needed this. I had no idea. Speaking of... 
Yeah. So speaking of labels, do you have any like perception of what BDSM was before you actually like walked into that club for the first time or did it never even cross your mind? It didn't cross my mind to that extent. I always knew that I was a dominant individual. I always knew that I wanted my partners to sit at my feet. I always knew that I wanted to prescribe protocols and rituals and have certain types of behaviors, but I always kind of chalked it up to this idea that I like a very structured existence. Like I, mm. I don't like change. And so that was kind of how I labeled it. But then once I realized the depth and breadth of what sexuality can be, I started to move into that direction and was open to it and actually thrived in it. It was like putting a fish in water. Just because I can survive on land doesn't mean I can thrive there. I thrive mm -hmm. in this giant ocean that we call alternative sexuality. Interesting. So um, you talk a lot about the healthy masculine movement. We hear a lot about toxic masculinity these mm -hmm. days. What's the difference between the way you're approaching masculinity and why is it important? Oh, that's a great question. Let me, let me think about that. That's, that's wonderful. I think the first thing that we have to understand is that the term masculinity is just a barometer by which we measure what a society feels is beneficial in its male-bodied population. A society benefits from people from the masculine go-getter mentality when at any cost um, your level of masculinity depends on how many of the opposite sex you can conquer. It's about conquest, right? This makes for a good soldier, but it doesn't make for a good partner, a good lover, a good father, a good friend. And so for me, when you start talking about the healthy masculine, what you start to do is say, hey, I can establish the criteria that I want to measure by. I don't have to let society do that for me just because I'm in this physical configuration. I can prioritize being a good son, a good husband, a good partner, a good lover, right? I can prioritize uh, the health, wealth, and well-being of the people around me and use that as the barometer by which I think masculinity should be uh, measured, right? I think it's really important also to remember that if society cre cre creates the parameters by which masculinity is assessed, then if we have toxic masculinity, we also have a toxic society. And so for me, the best way to change this is for each person to kind of come to this realization that you can take ownership of what you define as masculinity and then step into that and start healing not only your own psychic risk, but the risk that exists within society, right? You can start being a better example for your friends, family, uh, for your culture, for your um, ethnicity, for your religion. You can step into this kind of idea of what it means to be healthy masculine. What does being masculine mean to you specifically? Well, that's exactly it. It's just a measurement. It's just mm -hmm. a measurement. It's nothing more than a barometer in the same way an inch is just a measurement. In the same way a foot, a yard is just a measurement, right? Masculinity is not a thing. So if I was, if I was a man and I was, and I wanted to explore this more, maybe I'm feeling not masculine enough. Maybe I'm concerned I'm, I'm too masculine or I'm, I'm toxic masculine. What would you suggest to them would be the steps that they would take to, to be able to explore a healthy masculinity? Again, another great question. In my practice, I like to explore what we call the personal myth. And this is the stories that we tell ourselves about what we believe. See, once it's a belief, it's really hard to challenge because it's not supported by fact usually. It's usually conjecture, feelings, indoctrination, just kind of this Molotov cocktail of influence that we kind of uh, harden into this belief. So for me, let's talk about the stories that you tell yourself about what you believe about masculinity, both the good and the bad. Let's talk about it, let's examine it, and let's change your relationship to these beliefs. If you can change your relationship to these beliefs to where it's a beneficial story, you will usually get a beneficial outcome. What, how do we start weighing benefit? How does it benefit the people around you? How does it benefit you? How does it benefit your family? How does it benefit your job? How does it benefit your income? Right? 
because masculinity is just the center of the web in most cases of a man's world. It's about how we navigate our entire existence. So let's change our relationship to the narrative and eventually the whole thing changes. And that's kind of how I view it. I'm interested to hear your opinion on this because you mentioned that you were in a poly relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I hear a lot from men who, from my audience and, you know, there's, there's, I interview lots of women and men who are in non-monogamous relationships. And the comment that I see so often is that if you were willing to share your woman with another man, um, you are not masculine. You are not a man. You are a simp. You are all of these other things. What would you say to those people who harbor those beliefs? <laughs> I'm surprised that you used that word simp. That was a. Old... I see it. <laughs> Dude, that that word specifically is on my YouTube channel comments a lot, a That's lot. So interesting. That was an old <laughs> word that we used to use in the '80s, and um, in the early '80s, as a matter of fact, called somebody simp. It, it's actually an abbreviation for sympathetic. You're overly sympathetic to the words, plights, or emotions of your partner. And here's mm. the thing. I don't think being a simp is actually a problem. I think what it is, is people don't appreciate the care and the tenderness that certain people have. It's not respected by many uh, um, people, and they abuse that openness, that vulnerability that that person has. So I don't think a, a calling someone a simp is really um, a good thing to do. It's just really acknowledging that this person is sensitive and you're taking advantage of it or not appreciating this person for it. If you go by the original definition, right? So if you get a person who like cares about you, wants to do things for you, wants to come over and, and, and you know, make sure you're not starving or, or do some work or lift you out of your circumstances because making you feel good makes him feel good. He derives a sense of pleasure from pleasing you. I don't see why that's a problem. What I see mm -hmm. as a problem is how people treat those people, mm -hmm. right? If you want hyper-masculine, someone who's going to play this game of protectionism, I'm only going to give you what I think you should have. I'm not going to open myself up. I'm not going to be vulnerable. I'm going to keep my finances, my finances, your finances, your finances. I'll have sex with whoever I want, not talk to you about it, not be open about it. You can do the same exact thing. If that's what you term a good relationship, go for it. But just because someone runs contrary to that doesn't mean that they should be treated as weak or subordinate, mm -hmm. or a cuckold. That should look worse on the actual individual who's abusing that person's uh, desire to be in relationship fully, wholly, and mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. right. It's interesting that you brought up the word cuckold. There is um, a, a, a fan of mine who, who openly admits to being a cuck, and we've had this discussion a couple of times, and he says that, you know, he doesn't understand why people view, you know, cuckolding in such a negative term. He says, for me, I feel like if I have a partner who is so desirable and beautiful and amazing, I want to share her with other people. I want other people to enjoy what I enjoy. He's like, it's like, I think he likened it to having like a great car that like he wants to like share with other people. How, how does that resonate with you? I think that they have a very aggrandized version of what cuckolding is. <laughs> I think they're being, they've romanticized it very much. Um, so first of all, his analogy would be more like, I have a beautiful car and somebody takes it whenever they want to and kind of drives past me to show me that they're using my thing. And I derive a sense of gratification from them mm -hmm. using it whenever they want to and driving it the way, wherever they want to. That's cuckold. If, if what he sounds like he's describing is being in an open relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Two very different things. We have to separate the fetish of cuckolding or sexual humiliation from possibly what he's thinking of, which is kind of this romanticized version of an, being in an open relationship with another individual, right? Mm -hmm. we have to th you have to remember that there's three criteria for fetish, right? A fetish has something to empower, unempower, or transform. Those are the three main categories. So if the fetish is 
uh, unempowering you or weakening you, and you derive a sense of gratification from it, then it's a fetish, which is what cold culting is. If it's something that empowers you sexually, psychologically, emotionally, or even physically, right? It can be a fetish, especially if it's sexual. And that was what we can maybe talk about dominance, mastery, mistresses, so on and so forth. If it transforms you into a little cat, uh, animal, baby, right? Fetish, right? If you're talking about being cuckold and it unempowers you, it really t- makes you feel weak, makes you feel humiliated, makes you feel low, right? Then we can start talking about cuckolding, right? If mm-hmm. you derive a sense of gratification from that. Otherwise, it's not necessarily cuckolding. Do you think that there is anything inherently problematic with having a fetish like that where you're degraded and maybe you enjoy being humiliated? Do you, do you think that that's a problem for someone or could they have that kind of kink in a healthy fashion? If it's done consciously, then I don't see the problem with it. When both people agree to the terms and parameters, the space, place, time, and sacrifice associated with it, then I feel like it'd be healthy. As a matter of fact, now you get healthy healing, right? Because both are going into the space in the same way a surgeon has to break the skin, cut open the person, reach inside of their body to heal them. Sometimes we have to go into the space where we do a little hurt to get a lot of healing. Right. And that's kind of this idea of humiliation. Remember, the root word of humiliation is humility. Right. Mm -hmm. And anything that can help you develop healthy humility is a good thing. What I often find is cuckolding in our society is something that someone did to you. It was not consensual. And that's the negative association that we have with it. I was humiliated by this person and my per, and, and my wife or my husband was a co-conspirator in the process. I did not consent to this. And it's mm-hmm. harmed me. It didn't just hurt. It was harmful. But if two people sit down and have the conversation, I want to be with other people. And I want to be with you when you're with, you know, with those other people. I want to see you because it kind of hurts in a good way because I derive a sense of satisfaction from it, then maybe people can have, talk about the benefits and the risks associated with it. And both people can step into a, a way of being with it that feels good to both of them and they can start that journey. You just mentioned a really interesting point. You, you mentioned how the root word of, wait, did you say the root word of humiliation is humility? Did yes. I hear that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, you know, I, I, met and interviewed lots of dominatrixes in my time Mm -hmm. and, you know, even, and, and the opposite doms as well. And I've, and I've heard a a big trend towards people who have a lot of power, who like to like in their real life, right? Like CEOs, executives. And then when they, their sexual side, they like to switch, they like to be humiliated or they like to be submissive. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that that happens? Why is there such why is there such a switch from your real life to your sex life in cases like that? Well, let's, let's look at it like this. Actually, I'll make a comment. That's really unpopular. I don't care. Um, (laughs) Only people with real power can afford to put it down. Hmm. And that's just the way it works. Only people with real power can, can say, ah, I'm going to put this down for a night for a session, for a week, for a month. Those people are doctors, lawyers, engineers, cops. Uh, They make real world decisions in real time where people's lives are generally affected by it every day. They run a business and that business supports other people, other families. They are making decisions for the larger scale on a regular basis. They have that power and they come home and they say, I just want to put it down. Mm -hmm. for a moment. I just want to put it down for a session. I just need to let go of this process just for a little while so I can step into this place of uh, nothingness just to exist for a few moments outside of my day. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 
Interesting. Um, okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about kink, um, why it is important for people to embrace their kinks and um, the BDSM lifestyle. So hang tight. We'll be right back. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? Most Americans think they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions when the actual total is closer to $200 or more. That's right, you could be wasting hundreds of dollars each month on subscriptions you didn't even know about. This is why I love Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. It's an app that shows you all your subscriptions in one place and then cancels for you whatever you don't still want. It can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were still paying for. To cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash holly. Seriously, it could save you hundreds of dollars a year. That's rocketmoney.com slash holly. All right, guys, we are back. So to wrap up our last conversation, um, can you tell a little bit, me a little bit more about the humility side of the humiliation? Yeah, the energetic narrative of humility is H-U-M. Just like you have humiliation, you have humility, you also have humanness, humanity, right? It's really the small part that can, uh, that makes up the essentialness or the quintessentialness of our existence on this planet and how we relate to each other. We have to understand that within every positive interaction, there's also a possibly negative interaction. And so we heal each other by being able to go into these spaces, doing these quote unquote, humiliation acts, and then going through the process of healing it. We have a thing called aftercare where we get to say, you know what? You're really not that bad. You're really, you did a great job. You're an amazing person. So they go through this humiliation. But what we don't talk about is the healing work that we do immediately after that speaks to their humanness, their ability to relate to another person, to hear words of praise and affirmation in the moment. And that's something that we don't get on a regular basis in this society. I can remember being maybe 10, maybe not even five years ago was the first time that I heard a person say, go be great. Mm. Right. We don't get to hear that as men. Everyone expects like, as men, as in, and women, everyone expects for you to be intrinsically motivated, not externally motivated, but sometimes we need the validation. And sometimes going through this process of being broken down, being broken down, being lowered, being humbled, being humiliated, we can then start being built up, stacked up, compliment by compliment, validation through validation. And a person can re receive a different level of healing in that moment. Because most of the time when people humiliate you, they leave you broken. Mm -hmm. They never take the time to reinvest in you and to bring you back to a place where you're better than when they found you. That's so interesting. So do you think that there's something about that humiliation session that encourages this release that maybe lets you, breaks down your walls, lets go, uh, let, helps you let go of so many things so that the aftercare, the validation that you described that comes afterwards, you're more receptive to it. Cause maybe if you just walked into a validation session I remember once I went, I, I don't know if this even relates, but I went to a therapist once and she spent the whole time like telling me how awesome I was. And I felt like it wasn't helpful at all. And maybe it was because I, it just, the approach was wrong. Does that make sense? Exactly. Exactly. You have to be cracked open, you know, and when we think about cr being cracked open, it's almost a violent thing. You're, it's broken. It's cracked. It's fissured. It's ruptured, right? To get to that opening. But once we're open, it's like not only what you take out, but what you put in, right? And then you heal that rift. So for me, when you go into this space, a humiliation session, you are being cracked open. And it becomes a surrogate trauma that you can attach to the humiliation you received in junior high school, in high school, in college, or through your family, or from your dad, or from your mom. It becomes a fissure that accesses all the other fissures and you can begin to put this kind of sedentary work that, that kind of heals all those rifts over time. But it requires that the person be willing to step into this place of extreme vulnerability, extreme openness, even being raw in the moment, and then allowing someone to give. 
and put that love, affection, and healing energy back into them before they, mm -hmm. you know, go back out into the world. Kind of like your analogy earlier with the surgeon who needs to cut you open and get his hands in you in order to fix you. Exactly. And then sew you up right before they put you back out in the world. That's that right. process. That's a very <laughs> important part. <laughs> right? They have to mend you so that you can, you know, and then the process is just time, healing over time. Mm. Can you describe to us a little bit more like what specifically kink is and maybe why it's important for people to embrace their kinks rather than push them away? Yeah. Kink is any deviation from what that person views as normal sexual behavior. What's important about this definition is that we can't know what normal sexual behavior is. We have an idea. We have kind of this rough thought that we've gotten through the ethos, through our, you know, the murmurings of our friends, through movies, through conversation, through religion, you know, maybe walking in on your parents. We have this idea of what normal sexual behavior is, but there's no such thing as a normal. So kink is any deviation from what you think is normal sexual behavior. This also is a regulating kind of definition where there's no one true way, or we all have to deviate to the same degree. Anytime you're pushing your boundaries, your societal indoctrination, your idea of what's taboo and what's not, you are stepping into the world of kink. So I can have, and I do have a, uh, a couple clients who are from the Middle East, and one of my partners, their degree of kink is they want to be on top of their husband when having sex. Right. And for them, because, you know, sex is supposed to be something that happens to you, that you're just laying there and allowing this thing to happen. This is the cultural indoctrination within that space. That becomes a really big degree of deviation for them. Mm -hmm. While the husband being American wants to, you know, put rope, do shibari, fire play knives. And they're like, oh, my God, that's unattainable for me. That's unreachable. And, you know, to the guy, he's like, well, you're not really kinky. Everybody gets on top. I mean, you do that in junior high school. But he has to realize, not her. Her degree of deviation is different. It's just as extreme, just different. And we have to respect everyone's degree of deviation. For some people, going anal is too much. That's a huge thing we've asked for them because of their religious indoctrination, cultural indoctrination, right? Their inculturation and their acculturation. But for other people, because they grew up in a freer, more uh, a freer environment that was more permissive, their degree of deviation can be suspensions, being uh, hooks suspended, you know, by their flesh. I mean, they can get really extreme. But no deviation is more important than the other, more significant mm -hmm. than the other one, or more validating the other. So I'll repeat: kink is any deviation from what you think is normal sexual behavior. I know that you do a lot of counseling. Are, is there any particular kink that comes up fairly often for you that people struggle with um, accepting or perhaps they want their partner to embrace that they're very resistant to? Do you see like a pattern at all? Yeah. Most of the people that I get, they're struggling with sub submission surrender. That's really it. They want to be able to let go and receive and don't know how to. Mm -hmm. And we see it. In, what did, go ahead. Uh, no, please finish your thought. Okay. Uh, and it manifests in many different ways. Some people have uh, the idea that they can step into dominance and they don't have to deal with submission. They have a control issue, an issue with controlling outcomes, controlling behaviors, controlling how they're interacted with and how they interact with others. They have an issue with control, but it's not with control. It's with surrender. It's with allowing them to let go. And so even dominance have to deal with submission and surrender. Or we get people where the expectation is for them to surrender and they don't know how to let go. They don't know how to step into it for themselves because it's been pre-prescribed, pre-ordained that because you have breasts or vagina or because you identify as a, a female, that someone's supposed, you're supposed to let everyone do this to you. And so they build up walls and create dominance as a reason to not receive so that they don't 
betray their own kind. They'll betray the feminist movement. They'll betray whatever it is. But at the end of the day, they really want to let go. And so for me, allowing oneself to receive is the biggest fetish that I wind up coming into contact the most. Interesting. You, you also just mentioned something really interesting as well, is that, you know, people who consider themselves dominant or want to be, you know, a dom in that lifestyle have to also accept submission in some way. Could you expand on what you mean by that? Yeah. I, it's really interesting um, because power we interact with on a regular everyday basis, right? And really how dominance becomes the handle on this knife is, is that when you want to be responsible for other people and, you're, and you have power, that's really what dominance is about. And so for me, when you are willingly stepping into healthy dominance and a healthy relationship with power, you know how to receive um, criticism. You know how to receive affirmation. You know how to receive touch. You know how to receive um, pain and pleasure, right? We have to learn how to receive. Even listening authentically is a form of reception. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, helping bosses, CEOs learn how to step into a place of reception, becoming a holistic person in regards to power is a really big thing. So for me, I think that everyone needs to learn how to surrender to either their responsibilities, their roles, their desires, their feelings, their sexuality. You have to learn how to surrender and let go. It's a very basic process that each and every person needs to have to learn. The way that most people come into contact with this is people who micromanage. If, <laughs> you know what I mean? If they micromanage, oh, yeah. <laughs> they give you a task and then they can't let go. So they have to monitor you at every step of the way. They don't know how to let go and stop holding on because that's what mm -hmm. surrender is really comprised of. Two things, letting go and not holding on, right? So for me, everybody from the basic manager to the CEO to the, the, the mom in the home, a helicopter mom, right? Doesn't know how to let go and allow their children to have the experiences that they need to develop over time. Everyone needs to explore surrender to some degree because we're always in the power. We, in some cases, we're in a power play where we're guiding and leading other people, whether it's your children, whether it's your uh, parents who now, you're now taking care of, um, whether it's your job, whether it's your new company, we all have to step into it. And we all have to learn how to surrender. So you literally just described my life right now. Right now, I have a two-year-old toddler. Mm -hmm. I have aging parents who I'm taking care of. My dad is Parkinson's 81. He's just get back from the hospital. He's now wheelchair bound. Mm -hmm. Um, I have my job that I currently run and I'm, uh, now working as a partner on a startup. Um, <laughs> and literally you just described me. That was so weird. And I have to say like, for me, what you're saying right now is so true because for me, um, acceptance is the answer is like the mantra that I kind of like bring into my life at all times, because trying to, I've definitely had my bouts of trying to micromanage other people, trying to control the situation, being unable to let go, um, of the results. And that is something that like, I have been working on so much because when you spend your life trying to control like external circumstances, mm -hmm. you just set yourself up for failure all the time. And, and sometimes we just have to accept that like, we can only take the steps that we feel is right. We can only control what, how we react to things, what we do. And then everything else is like the universe is going to like take care of itself. And that is a hard lesson to learn. Very much, very much. And thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you sharing that with me and the audience. Um, yeah. So for me, it's really important to step in and help people with their relationship to power and for them to understand that we are both, uh, masculine and feminine, we are both dominant and submissive. And we have to be able to utilize both polarities of power to our benefit. Because if we don't, it'll be to our detriment. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I have a program that's empowerment from the boardroom to the bedroom, because really power exists in both places and everywhere in between. 
And so I hope that people will step into this idea of letting go and not holding on and understanding how to do that uh, successfully and respectively. Right. So let's talk a little bit about your relationships. Um, you've been in a relationship for over 25 years with your partner and you guys have a dominant submissive relationship. Can you talk a little bit about how that works for you? And did you enter into the relationship with those roles or did that evolve over time? Okay. Um, so just to be specific, I have a poly partner of 30 plus years, a, okay. a partner of 26 years, a two partners of 15 years. I just stepped out of a, pro a relationship of 15 years and have another one of four years, right? Wow. <laughs> You're busy. <laughs> yeah, I hired to retire. That's what I like to say. <laughs> it comes with a great pension plan. And uh, it's <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but my, my par partner of 26 years is a person that most people are familiar with. Her name is Indigo Black. She's been in my life pretty much my entire adult life. And, um, and yeah, we've been inseparable since our meeting. And no, I didn't come into this from a poly space. What I did was I had a partner who is still here. Um, she was my high school sweetheart. Uh, she was the person who left and came back and introduced me to King. Right, right. And, okay. um, and I met Indigo and I was like, I want you both you know, and both of them decided to stay. And so for me, it was a wonderful opportunity to be with two women that I've loved, you know, uh, pretty much my entire existence, you know, mm -hmm. and that's where it started. And we thought we were the only people. We felt like we were shipwrecked on an island uh, because nobody could really understand uh, who we were, what we were creating, the feelings that we um, had cultivated over time. And so we took on the challenges of being A, Black, B, Polly, <laughs> raising five kids, three people raising five kids together. And um, in, in, a, in a neighborhood that wasn't really reflective of those lifestyle choices. And we just mm. chose to stick by our guns and become life partners. And we have ever since. How do you, so how do you, specific, what are the most important aspects I should say that you feel have made your relationship successful? Really a couple different philosophies. I, I really believe in prime directives. And so if any of your, uh, audience or nerds like me, <laughs> you'll know that comes from uh, Star Trek, but kind of these prime directives that are put in place and just are kind of the presiding outline for how we move through the world. And that's always do us in the best interest of the family, right? It's really easy for the person who's the oddball like me. Uh, it's, it's one male and multiple females in this, um, in this dynamic it's really easy for me to start getting a big head for me to be like, Oh, do this, do that because I'm the Dom. And because I quote unquote have the most power in the relationship. But for me, I always default to what's in the best interest of the family. Even if it's counter to what I want, I try to always do this in the best interest of the family. Mm -hmm. um, the other uh, number two is really love each other as I have loved you. I have to remember that I set the pace and the tone and the cadence for how other people interact. They'll never, um, they'll never do it without an example. I have to show people how I care for my wife so that they can love them at least a fraction of how much I love her. They have to show, I have to show my wife how much I, I love our girlfriend so she can love her at least a fraction, if nothing else, a fraction of how much I love that person. So I always have to remind myself that I'm leading by example. And really the last thing is if something breaks, fix it, right? The, it, it's not about who broke it. It's about what are we going to do to fix it? You know, I can sit here and point fingers all day and try and force people to take responsibility or, or to make somebody wrong or feel bad or someone needs to prove themselves right. That's great. Okay. But how are we going to fix it? So I really put the onus on let me hear what the issue is. And now let's figure out the best way to go about 
making this right for you. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, 26 years of group involvement, right? Those are the less, the three lessons that I can really say are the most pervasive. I would say that there's probably 12 in total, but those are the most three that got me as far as I am today. You said that you have um, all raised five children together. Has that proved challenging because you don't fit the like typical marital norms? Um, Like, does it come up at school at all? Or is there something that makes it, you know, because I I think a lot about now is because I moved in with my parents about a year ago to help take care of them. I think a lot about the, you know, this Western culture idea of like, the husband and wife have to move away from their parents, live on their own. Nowadays, both work full time, raise children, you know, and we've moved away from the idea of like a community or a group of people, like, you know, being raised by a village. So they say, Mm -hmm. um, do you find that being in that kind of like group, um, with your partners is helpful in raising your children? Are there drawbacks? Like, how does that work? Oh yeah, there's always going to be pluses and minuses, and just to just so we're on the same page, my kids are grown. They're go- grown and gone. <laughs> my our okay. youngest is 26. We have grandkids now, right? So, oh wow! <laughs> so we are we are pretty much done. But when it was happening, and this is important to say, was this poly was still emerging as a thing. I remember seeing the first um, TV conversation on MTV about Polly, which is where we learned the word from, but we'd already been doing it for about five years. So this kind of idea of Polly as it exists today and where, where it's more palatable, we were doing it where it was absolutely unacceptable. And so for me, it was essential to raise my kids in this way because my partners were able to give my children things that I couldn't. Right. I, I'm not great at math or academics, but our other partner that is no longer here, it, you know, has a master's degree and Ph.D. and really got our kids as far as they could go academically. They, I wouldn't have been able to provide them with that. Right. Mm-hmm. But I also tried to uh, give a healthy masculine archetype for my son and for the daughters. Right. We tried to be there. There was always someone to be at a recital or at a game or, you know, if two people are working, it's hard to look up in the stands and not see your parents there. Right. At least there was some representative of the unit to say, we're here to support you. Right. Yeah. To me, that is absolutely essential to a kid's development, especially as a kid who grew up playing football and never saw his parents up in the stands. Never saw his parents up in the bleachers, never at a away game, no one to drive you anywhere, you know? So for me, I never wanted my children to have to go through that. And at the time, it wasn't a conscious thought, but in hindsight, I got to give them the type of experience that we didn't. So yes, in this society, radical individuality, even as a couple becomes this, in, in in my feeling, a kind of sick, kind of pervasive thing because we're not prioritizing the necessities of the children. And Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from the framework of our society, not just the couple, but the society that says you should just be two people in a home working eight eight hours a day, commuting uh, two hours a day, and then coming home and giving your children whatever you have left, giving each other whatever you have left. Right. And then repeating that process and hoping for the best outcome, as opposed to stepping into a place of humility, creating a community and really sharing the experiences, the love, the responsibilities, but also the problems, you know, more hands make the work light. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's man. I can relate to that so much. (laughs) (laughs) I can't even tell you a question. So your partners, are they also, uh, are they monogamous to you or do they also like sleep with other people or have relationships with other people? That's a good question. So I have partners who are currently monogamous. They're not, um, made to be monogamous. That's not a condition of their being here. Um, Mm -hmm. we have two that are married and my wife is not current. 
that's not true. <laughs> my wife is dating our girlfriend <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> and her wife. And uh, so they are in a relationship. And um, my other partners were dating our girlfriend's boyfriend at one point in time. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so it's, so it's, it's just a, a big love soup. <laughs> it's a big love soup, you know, but, but I think what's important is I think when most people ask that question or maybe the listeners, it's not a condition for them being here to be in that type mm -hmm. of relationship, to be in monogamous to me or to be in a monopoly dynamic where I'm poly and they are not. That is not the condition for them being here. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to, to ask that question because like I said before, you know, like 96% of my audience are men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see, I talk to a lot of men who struggle with masculinity, their idea of masculinity. I think their big attraction to porn in the adult industry is, you know, the hypersexuality of the women that they enjoy viewing, but then they really struggle with this idea of them as human beings and having like a relationship with somebody yet having sex with other people for a job. Like I see a lot of that conflict with my viewers. So I always, I thought you'd be such a great guest to ask these questions <laughs> too, because I think that you can bring a lot of insight into that. So, so thank you so much. Well, I was also in the adult industry. You know what I mean? And I actually think this is a very, again, another kind of polarizing comment, but I don't think the adult industry is as bad as people make it out to, you know, in the same way that there are some pharmacal, uh, pharmaceutical drugs that are essential to someone's existence, right? And then there's uh, another pharmaceutical drug, that same pharmaceutical drug can be abused by a bunch of people, right? It's just something there for people to use for enjoyment and gratification. And in the same way people could use, you know, some kind of rap lyric uh, as an excuse for shooting people or some hard rock lyric for, for committing this crime or reference this movie for doing this rape. Like, you know, you can we can use porn as the big villain in our structure. So for me, what's important is to separate the realities of our existence as whole human beings, mm -hmm. right? And the one dimensional narrative associated with porn. Porn is only showing you a fifth of a percent of the existence of those characters in that world, right? Yeah. It's, it's if you watch the movie and just cut out the sex scene, mm -hmm. right? So you're not getting a fully developed understanding of the entirety of those characters. Just like if you focus on just a per what a person does in the bedroom, you're not getting the entirety of that individual. Right. Yeah. So for me, it's really important to, for them to be realized and actualized and see that these people are whole human beings, whether it's your favorite porn star or the lady at the cash register at the circle K, it's really important for you to see everybody as whole human beings. You're not getting a relationship with their sexuality. You're getting a relationship with a human being. Yeah. I think that's what people struggle with a lot because you know, the whole kind of point of my show was to humanize adult stars. And I've had, you know, I mean, I've the, actually the episode that um, is going to air right before yours, I had a porn star on and we ended up talking about her son who has cerebral palsy and we both like started crying. Like I've had mm -hmm. these really emotional human connection moments with these women and men. Mm -hmm. And I think it just really rocks a lot of people's worlds because they're so used to having this very one dimensional idea of what a porn star is. They, they, watch porn, they enjoy it, but it's also that shameful secret that it is for most people. And so when they're confronted with the idea that, oh my gosh, this is a human being and this person does have a life and maybe they have a partner and maybe they have these feelings, I think it confuses and creates a lot of conflict in people. So it's really interesting that you would say that. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. I mean, I, I've played with some of the greats. I've done live shows with, you know, people I will mention their name because I don't know if they want to be outed anymore. <laughs> like if they're <laughs> out anymore. But I've I've been with celebrities. I, I've I've done parties with with big names. And every time I meet them, I go, hey, he's a real person just like me. But it also yeah. acknowledges that I was only seeing a fraction of who they were in their entirety. And so for me, 
it's really important for people who are watching porn to realize that these are actors and actresses engaging in a very specific aspect of the scene. In the same way, people who do improv, it's a very specific part. You know, it's a very specific role within acting. Porn is a very specific role within acting. But once they put the cameras down, they are real human beings with real lives, you know, doing real things. And it's important um, for as human beings, not as fans, not as not as the audience, because as audience, we want we want to believe that these people are really these what people. We're right? Saying, right, right. <laughs> right. But we want to step into this real role that once we're not in our role as audience, as viewers, as fans, that we can humanize these people and realize, oh, this is a real individual living a real life with real consequences. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that they are not your fantasy and you have no right to lock them into their fantasy. I think that one of the other reasons that we kind of lock people into a paradigm is because as if they don't change, neither do we. If, if they are at the conduit by which I access my sexuality, by locking them into that paradigm, I always have a constant access to my own sexuality. We do the same thing when we see people stunt the growth of their wives or their husbands. I don't want you to grow and develop because it would force me to grow and develop. And I don't know if I'm going to like who I become or whether I will like you or it might start bringing up things. I might have to start doing real work on my life if I start going into this place. So we can never sit here and just go, am I locking them into this way of being for them or for me? Right? That's a really powerful, insightful viewpoint. Wow, that's that's something definitely to think about. Mm. Amazing. <laughs> I would say you're pretty good at your job. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm working on it. I'm working. <laughs> um, I also want to ask you about uh, the fact that you are a breath expert. Um, you've been called into courtrooms to speak on things like consent, consensual kinks, and autoerotic, autoerotic asphyxiation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm considered an expert in the state of California in erotic asphyxiation, not autoerotic asphyxiation. Okay. <laughs> so, What's, I, and can you actually tell us the difference between the two for those who may not know? Yeah, asphyxiation is anytime air or blood is being restricted to the brain, right? So when it's autoerotic asphyxiation, it's where you have an implement trigger or contraption that is doing it for you and you're doing mm-hmm. it alone versus Mm -hmm. doing it in general with someone else. So if I do erotic asphyxiation, I am choking my partner, wife, so on and so forth. Whereas someone else is going into a closet, maybe hanging themselves or doing something else that is really not, and I just want to stress this, really not safe. There's nothing safe about it, okay? No matter how many times you've done it, eventually it will catch up to you. So. I, there's a difference between erotic asphyxiation where you talk to someone and you make an agreement about what you're doing and then you t- receive some training and you have expertise you have uh, in, in this field and you do it versus people who are doing it by themselves in the privacy or, or hiding in the recesses of their home trying to get off. Mm-hmm. Wow. So tell us a little bit about, can you speak on any of the cases, even just in general terms, um, yeah. about these ones that you've been called in, your expertise has been called in on? Yeah. In most cases, I get brought in to help the jury understand why people engage in this type of practice. The next thing that I'm usually brought in for is to help people understand what the practice is and how it's done safely. The next thing that we talk about is why people would consent to doing this type of behavior, right? And the next thing is, how do we define if it's malicious, negligent, or if it is um, something that that happened on the, as, a, as a fluke, something that just mm. accidentally happened? So those are usually my rules uh, when I step in there. I try not to come in. I can come in for the defense. I can come in for the uh, prosecution. But usually it's to help people understand the nuances of this thing because most people don't know about it. Right. Without getting into too much detail, because it sounds like this would be a lot 
to unpack. And you probably, I imagine, have done workshops and classes and such <laughs> on this. Definitely. Why, why do people enjoy um, erotic asphyxiation? What is the high that comes from that? Well, actually, you you kind of nailed it. There is a high associated with it. And um, I, I don't want to do this thing. There's, there's this movie where um, they parody the movie Ray, where they go, the guys, they're doing drugs. This guy walks in. He says, you don't want to do it. He says, why? He said, because it feels really good. It's like, no, I think I want to do it. <laughs> like, oh, you're going to get high. Well, uh, no, I think I want to do it. You know, I mean, it's like I don't want to create this criteria where people like really get turned on with because it's really not the safest thing to do. That being said, um, most people do it because they're achieving a level of erection that they normally wouldn't get under any other circumstances. For the past 150 to 200 years, uh, people prescribed self-asphyxiation as a way of achieving erection. It's called angel lust. People, doctors and physicians noticed that when people were hung, that they would get massive erections. And so it was originally used as a cure for erectile disorder. Okay. That is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so that is one of the things. One of the reasons that people were can often castrated before lynching was so that the erection wasn't visible right really yes especially in the south during uh, antebellum slavery that was part of the castration process so that they you know the, this kind of erection the, the masculine erection wasn't visible to the um to the public and this is why you almost never see erection in those videos i mean in those pictures because so, it would be offensive versus actually exactly hanging somebody that's not offensive but the the erection is offensive exactly is that the idea exactly <laughs> <laughs> so 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 basically people can get an erection doing this but it is very dangerous as i said before most people the people die when they're being hung and they get this erection but that's one of the reasons why i do it another reason is because ejaculation combined with oxygen deprivation can produce hallucinations it can produce sensations that are associated with like um being on cocaine and having sex or ecstasy mm. it is fleeting and it causes a craving and people want to do it over and over and over again they get almost, almost addicted to it are you so do you teach classes or workshops on how people could engage in this practice safely i do and very rarely <laughs> I used to do very big classes and uh, my lawyer's like, dude, you're going to have to cut back on doing yeah. these classes because it's, it, you know, it's just a time bomb waiting to happen. And, um, but my, my thing is, is one of the reasons why people get hurt is because no one talks about how to do it as safely as humanly possible. Remember, you mm -hmm. can't do dangerous things safely. You can only do them safer. Right. Right. That's a good point. You know, so you have to go in, you have to learn from somewhere because most people are choking or putting their hands around necks. They're arresting breath or they're arresting uh, blood flow. They're doing something in their bedroom. I, I can't think of any of my friends, my ever kinky friends or any of my clients that at one point in time in one of their partnerships was either asked to be choked or had a hand around their throat. Mm -hmm. Right. It's something that people are doing and they have to understand how to mitigate the risks as best as possible. Mm. What is the most common thing that you uh, consult on or do workshops on? Like, what would you say is is the I was going to say the butter on your bread, but that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, I like the butter. A big bread, bread. your bread and butter. Like, what's your most common <laughs> thing that people come to you wanting to be educated on, wanting to learn more about? Honestly, I think that people come for many different things, but what they're really asking me about is really how to navigate power, how to step into their power, mm -hmm. how to have power dynamics. Uh, I get a lot of people say, how do I get my husband to be more dominant? Or how do I get my wife to be more specific, uh, submissive? But really what they're saying is I need to have a better relationship with power within the framework of my relationship. How do I do that? And that's what I do. See, the tools are just like a painter's brush. They're just an extension of your desire. 
they're just an extension of your expression. So as long as you have a healthy relationship to power, leadership, responsibility, submission, surrender, you can pick up any of these tools and use them in a way that's healing and beneficial, that can drop you deep into your sex and sexuality. But without that, you can't do any of it safely. And so for me, I break my coaching up into two things, doing versus being. We start with the being first, right? We help you learn how to be in surrender, be in submission, be in dominance, be in the place of responsibility, right, et cetera. And then once you have that framework, then we learn how to do all the things that are expression of our sexuality. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, it it just, you know, that the power dynamic, I feel like that is just something that, as you mentioned, is just interwoven into the fabric of our life and everything that we do. You know, as human beings, I feel like we're always trying to achieve power um, in one way or another. So it sounds like I'm sure that this spreads out into so much more than just power in the bedroom for you. I'm sure that, you know, this kind of touches everything. Yeah. Most of my clients are, are entrepreneurs. Most of them are, uh, another portion of them are CEOs. Another good portion of them are people who work in positions of power. Um, but I have no people who are like um, in this space of inferiority. They're always mm-hmm. trying to get to that next space, to do this, to, to hone their craft, to hone their skill, to be better, to be bigger, to be better, to be, to do more. They want mm. that for themselves. And now they've, they're taking the initiative to make a healthy connection to power. Look, people have done healthy connections to abundance and their relationship to uh, the poverty mindset. And that's great. But once you've done that, now what, how do we relate to power? You've done money, now power. We've done sex, mm. power. That's the top mm. of the, the pyramid. Yeah. Right? And so once we can heal a person's relationship to power, it's like fire. You burned yourself once. And now every time you come into contact with it, you reflexively pull away. Mm -hmm. Right. Once we heal that and they can step into it, hold it, look at it, examine it. They can understand how to work with it and how to make it work for them. To me, in that space, we can start stepping into everything that is essential about our existence. Yeah. Because I mean, so often we use those external things to define what power is, right? You just mentioned money. You just mentioned sex. People think if they have enough money, if they have enough sex, that means that that they have power, but you're saying that it it's so much more than that. And it's so much deeper than that. And it starts from within. And then that changes your relationship to all the external things that we define as what makes somebody powerful. Yeah. It, it's like the magic glasses. Once you put them on, you can never take them off. You all, even if you took them off, you still know it's there. And you start yeah. seeing those power dynamics between you. Oh, your parents. It's like, oh, I see the power dynamic. Oh, it's your boss at work, your manager, um, your, your employees. You see the power, all the threads and how power is moving within the framework of your friendships, uh, of your, your business dealings, uh, your relationships, your flirtations, right? Understanding that everybody has power is really important because people who don't know that they have power, the people who are most likely to harm other people, Mm. you know, it's like a bear trying to be soft. You know I mean? It's like, no, you're powerful. You have to manage this. You have to, to know how you're interacting with this baby, this little thing, right? Because if you act like you're just everybody else, you're going to harm somebody. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that's my, that's my big thing is healing people's relationship to power. Last thing, let me just say this. Aristotle, uh, no, Socrates kind of defined a knife as having the quintessential thing about a knife. What makes a knife a knife is the fact that it's sharp, right? But without a handle on it, it's useless, right? Oh. Everybody knows what power is. My job is to help put the handle on it to help you better be able to work with it. Right. Rather than cut yourself. Exactly. 
Yeah, I love that. Orpheus, thank you so much. This has been, I was, I had, I had high expectations for this interview. I was not disappointed. <laughs> um, this has been really, really interesting and um, it's definitely given me a lot to th- think about. I think my audience is going to really uh, respond well to this too. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online if they're interested in, in taking one of your workshops or doing a class or all the things that you offer? Definitely. You can go to uh, Guru, I'm sorry, you can go to OrpheusBlag.com and um, all my information is there. You can also go to uh, Orpheus Black on Mighty Networks and join our network uh, where we're giving tips and tidbits and you basically will get all the information before anybody else, even my website. Or you can find me on at Guru Orpheus Black on any social media. So look me up love talking, love interacting, and we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter, of course. And if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure that you go and find Orpheus, follow him and maybe drop him a message. Let him know that you uh, discovered him here. Thank you guys so much for listening or watching wherever you are. And I will see you next week.